Um, anyway, so just to tell you a little bit about me before I get started so that you know who I am and why I'm up here talking about these things. My name is Violet Blue, and I'm a writer. I have over 40 published books that I have authored and edited, many that have won awards, and they've been translated into many languages. They are mostly about human sexuality. For my day job, I'm an investigative reporter for CBS News, CNET, and I also write for ZDNet and the security blog Zero Day. So I do a lot of writing and a lot of other fun stuff. But I'm going to tell you about some of the other things that I do as well, which specifically has to do with a theory that I have that I want to share with you. So I'm going to do some idea sharing. And again, thank you so much for coming and spending a little bit of time um, kind of geeking out with me on some things that I've been thinking about for a little over a year now. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about tonight is a concept called harm reduction. And I'm going to talk about harm reduction and its different applications in its particularly unique way of taking situations that are risky and risky for individuals and being able to d reduce the harmful consequences of these risky actions. And it's, it's, it has some very, very interesting actions about it. So we're going to talk about harm reduction methodology, how it works, and ways to use it. And then we're going to talk a little bit about my theory, which is that I have come to see hackers as a high risk population and what that means. So first, I want to tell you about harm reduction. Harm reduction is typically referred to as a strategy or a strategy of public health policies um, that essentially aim to, de to reduce the harm or the harmful consequences associated with risky behaviors or risky activity. And the type of risky activities that we're talking about usually in the public health policies are drug use, um, HIV and AIDS prevention, and also sex work, prostitution. And it's these programs are fairly controversial. They've been around for a couple of decades, but they're only instituted into public policy in a couple of countries officially, um, Switzerland, Canada, and Holland, to be exact. Um, they are employed in other areas in different countries, um, but seldom officially, because harm reduction itself is highly controversial, and I will explain why. Harm reduction essentially meets the person who engages in the risky behavior or acts in the risky ways um, at their level. So what it does is it suspends judgment about the risky activity or whatever risk the person is taking. And instead of applying judgment or anything like that, basically says, okay, you're doing this activity. We're acknowledging that you're just going to do this activity. We're not going to stop you. So for instance, um, the just say no drugs approach um, is a really good example, I think, of failure. Um, but it's something that's instituted widely because of societal perceptions about drugs and drug use, it fits a certain moral code that then gets put into policy place and is considered acceptable because it follows the code that drugs are bad. And so therefore people that do drugs are bad and so it should just stop, those bad people should just stop. Well, that doesn't work very well. Uh, as it turns out, people do drugs anyway. Um, so rather than a just say no approach or a black and white approach to something like drug use, what harm reduction aims to do is essentially say, OK, you're going to do these things. So what we're going to do is we're going to give you the tools to make informed choices about the risks that you're taking and arm you with information, arm the, the people at risk about information so that they, when they do engage in the activity, they do so with less risky consequences to themselves, to their communities, to the people that they care about. So um, examples would be, uh, for instance, with uh, need, like drug use, like intravenous drug use, uh, syringe and needle exchange. And so what this does is by doing something like a needle exchange program, um, it essentially discourages sharing of needles. Because if a drug user is in the moment and they're going to engage in the activity and they don't have a fresh or clean needle, they're just going to grab one from a friend or everyone's going to share. But the idea behind, so I think you see what I mean. It's, it's, a, it's a means of preventing the harmful consequences rather than judging the activity and saying just stop the activity altogether. So what's neat about harm reduction, so this is, so harm reduction has been in place with, with those three particular areas for a while, um, uh, that being sex work, drugs, and HIV prevention. Um, but what a lot of us have been finding, and I'll explain who us are in a minute, is that um, harm reduction is a very, very nimble and interesting system. Um, simple systems are usually the best systems. And so with harm reduction methodology, um, I've been working with a couple of different organizations that have taken harm reduction methodology and applied them to different areas is working with at-risk populations. And I'm going to explain what that is. So 
I'm going to tell you about the three organizations or the three efforts that I've been working for the past 10 years where harm reduction methodology has been applied in a very different and interesting way with really good results. Um, I've been working with this organization for over 10 years, actually. This is San Francisco Sex Information. We, for some reason, call it SFISI. Um, but what SFISI is, is it's a nonprofit organization that's been around actually for almost three decades. And it's essentially a crisis hotline. Um, hotline in all senses, it, you know, we do have a phone switchboard where people answer phones. Um, and take sex crisis questions, but also email hotline and a chat hotline sometimes as well. And so what we do is basically we do we do peer-to-peer -peer counseling. It's anonymous, it's confidential, it's free, and it's non-judgmental. And we are a team of a couple dozen activists and educators in the sex and health space. So I work with MDs, I work with nurses, I work with um, people who do couples counseling, I work with people who do needle exchange, I work with people who do who work in women's community clinics, and we as educators get together and we answer phones and we help people and people call and they'll say, you know, instances can include, you know, I, I tried this sex act, I got something stuck in this place, do I need to go to the hospital? Or I just had sex for the first time and I can't stop bleeding, what do I do? Or I'm going to have sex for the first time, what birth control can I get that my mom won't notice? That sort of thing. So as you can imagine, what we do is pretty controversial, but it's had a very high success rate. It's been very interesting. Another thing that we do as well, besides the, um, the crisis counseling, is that we teach classes twice a year in which we, as a group, get together and we teach an intensive series of classes to other educators. So, and this is in the United States, this is in San Francisco, California, and in the United States, doctors MDs typically get a very short amount of sex education unless they go and specialize in something like gynecology. So they don't learn about sexual risk situations and they don't learn about fringe sex acts or things like that that are eventually probably going to end up in their office someday. So what we do is we we teach classes, they're very small classes. We have to screen and interview applicants. It's a very high demand class. And um, we teach nurses and doctors and, and other caregivers how to talk to um, underserved populations about the issues that they're going to be facing, which include things like uh, sexual fetishes, um, uh, lesbian, gay, bi, trans issues, um, just you name it, pretty much everything. And that sometimes also includes talking about things that are risky, things that are illegal, or things that are in gray areas. Um, SFISI in particular has been pretty con uh, controversial because not only we're doing it with anyone who calls us giving out this information in what uh, you probably understand is a very sexually conservative com uh, country, at least in terms of policy, um, but also we have an interesting way that we apply harm, harm reduction as well in that we take the harm reduction methodology in that we, you know, we accept that the people that we're talking to and that we're calling are going to engage in these behaviors anyway. Um, that something like curiosity is not something that is to be shameful or afraid of. And we are finding that interestingly enough, um, it turns out when you treat people who ask questions about weird sex acts, well and respectfully, and you don't treat them like they're broken or they should be ashamed of wanting to try something different, turns out it actually reduces the harm in terms of the consequences that come up when they decide to take their chances or make their risky choices. If you shame someone about what they're doing, they're going to probably make a bad decision that's going to have difficult consequences for them, infect someone later, or get them hurt somehow. So like I said, we've had really, really good results. Another thing that we do that's controversial is that we approach the things that we talk about from the perspective that these people are probably doing these things because they're they're fun, which is a concept that we'll come back to in a little bit. Um, one of the talks that I give, that we give here, I give it Security B-Sides this year um, in Las Vegas, which is a sex and drugs talk. And that talk in particular talks about a range of drugs um, from over-the-counter drugs to prescription drugs to illegal drugs and experimental drugs, what the effects of those drugs are, why people do them, how they feel good to the people that do them, what the negative reactions to drugs these drugs can be, and then how they interact with sex and sexual physiology. So it's, um, it's not a talk that we can really give anywhere because of the societal views on drugs and sex especially put together, and that we say people do them because they're fun. So anyway, so another thing that we've been doing at SFISI with harm reduction too that you'll find very interesting is that we also have changed some of the language that we use when we talk to people about these risky acts that they engage in. So rather than saying, if someone asks us a question about something, rather than saying, well, you know, 
everybody knows that this is good, or nobody ever does that. We say things like some, many, and most. So some people may find that this works for them. Many people try this. And what's interesting is that in, in terms of behaviors, it mitigates the idea that people are going to have to find a code or a set of ethics in order to understand what works best for them and their communities. So we empower people with sets of tools to be able to make decisions that are best for them, which is why this talk isn't an ethics talk, even though you probably saw in my, uh, my write-up there are mentions of ethics in it. Um, Harm reduction isn't about ethics. Harm reduction is about non-judgment. It's about making your own set of systems so that you can figure out what ethics are best for you. So another area that I've been applying harm reduction in is complex humanitarian emergency trainings. This is through UCSF's Global Health Program. And what we do is we do a couple of times a year a live action simulation where we um, get together, we being me and a lot of people who work at UCSF and also people who work with NGOs, non-governmental organizations such as the American Red Cross, Doctors Without Borders and other organizations. And people fly in to come and teach and we do live action simulations where we take people who want to go work for the Red Cross and people who want to work at Doctors Without Borders and we put them through a live action crisis simulation where we, like the recent one that we did, a, I think it was about two months ago, was we simulated a crisis on the uh, Syrian border um, where the students or the trainees would have to come in and basically have to help the refugees survive. And, they were first on the scene, everything was minimal. What we do is we get, we get the trainees in, um, they come in for the weekend, they have to give up their entire weekend and they camp on site. Um, they come in, they're given passports, they're given currency, and then they have their first border incident. Um, and it's pretty intense, so they have a border incident and they come in and they're basically put through all of these different live exercises where they have to learn to navigate situations that they're going to be in or may be in. Um, would they be flown in to take care of refugees on the Syrian border. So they learn how to clean water. They learn how to deal with disposing of dead bodies. Uh, one of the things that they do is a wilderness, uh, a wilderness medical training where essentially groups of the students will be put together and then sort of like herded down a road and they come around a corner. They're not really expecting this. And there are injured people all over the place and we have great actors that come in and they have fake blood and it's really gory and there are always gunshot wounds. There are always mysterious trauma, um, and the situation that they're put in is that they don't know if some of the people there are plants, um, they don't know if some of the people there are, are insurgents, um, and they find out that they are also being watched by insurgents while they're trying to treat these people who are screaming and wailing, and it's very intense. And actually, last time I was watching, uh, no, time before last that I was watching them do this, um, I, was, I was observing, and this, I spotted this guy like up in the bushes watching everybody and it was really creepy, so I took that photo. Um, another thing that, that is done during this training is something called Geneva Convention Training, where the students are actually abducted. Um, they're bottlenecked and then they're trapped and then they're interrogated and they're tortured. And they have to make serious choices about what type of information they're going to give up and learn how to survive. Um, mind you, the mock torture is that we have people planted in them that get tortured off site and you just hear them screaming, but you get the idea. Um, the part of this that I do is I do a media training. And so what I do is I come in and I pretend that I'm an asshole from CNN and I, I interview them because this really happens. Um, so I come in and I come in with a, a, you know, the badge, the everything, camera, and I get in their faces and I'm like, you know, where are the dead bodies? I mean, but it's, it's not that simplified actually. What I do is I do a series of very specific interview techniques that journalists and reporters use in the field in order to extract stories out of people who are disarmed and extract stories that will bring in high drama for their networks and get them ratings and get them news. And what I do is I walk all the students through all of the situations in which reporters try and trick people into saying things that they don't want to say and then I teach them all of the techniques that are going to be done on them or might be done on them if they're on camera um, and the reason that we do all of these things is because what we want to do is take these people who are engaging in this really really risky behavior and give them tools to be able to navigate this in a way that is safe and protects the people that they care about and protect the people that they are trying to care about or hoping to help um, one of the men that I work with um, has uh, he does a lot, he's done a lot of work in Sudan, for instance, and um, he's, he's one of the field nurses that trains along with us, and he's treated a lot of rape survivors in Sudan, and 
he explains why this is so important in that he's been in situations where he has had dying patients and has had reporters come in and try and put the cameras in the faces of his dying patients and he's had to physically remove the reporters and the camera people in order to protect his patients. So these people who will want to go do this stuff for a living, they need to understand the risks that they're in, but also be able to have a set of tools with which they can operate in order to navigate and make the choices that are most appropriate to them, rather than you know, freaking out or rather than having people try and discourage them from wanting to go and do their jobs or get on site and have other, other elements attempt to discourage them from engaging in the behaviors that they're engaging in. So. Homeless youth outreach is another thing that I've been specifically doing a lot of work in harm reduction in. So you'll see a, a bit more of a direct model of harm reduction here. Um, and what this is, is that um, I've done, been doing some homeless outreach for the past couple of years in San Francisco, specifically with homeless youth. And my experience with that is that, I'll just I'll go ahead and tell you the story of how I got involved. And how I got involved with the homeless youth outreach is that um, I was a homeless teen. I ran away from home when I was 13. Um, and most of my family at the time was dead. And now all of my family is dead. But I left home because I was in a, a very drug and violent environment. And in order to survive, I needed to leave. Um, and so I did, and I lived on the streets in San Francisco until I was almost 18. I got off the streets, and then fast forward a couple of years later, I have books coming out. I'm signing books in this bookstore in the Upper Haight, and I casually said to the people who were running the bookstore, wow, this is really cool because I used to beg for food outside your door. And they were like, what? And so we started talking about this, and they said, well, you know, we've been having a, a big problem between the neighbors in this neighborhood and the kids um, because the kids, they have nowhere to go. You know, they're begging for food. Some of them are doing crimes. Some of them are doing drugs openly. And, we're, you know, the, the residents in the neighborhood are doing what they can to basically make the problem go away. And the owners of the bookstore were like, this, this doesn't make sense because this isn't going to go away. You know, and what we want to do is try and do, facilitate some discussion between the two elements and see what we can do. Would you like to come talk? And I was like, sure. So I went to their first meeting where they invited Larkin Street Youth, which is an outreach organization in the hate, to talk to neighborhood residents. And it was a shit show because the neighborhood residents were literally these like really, really wealthy older people who were like, these kids should just get jobs or they should just go home. And the outreach workers that were trying to talk to them from the stage were having a really, really hard time explaining why they give these kids food and why they give these kids shelter and why they give these kids um, counseling and why they help these kids get tested for STDs and for drugs and things like that. And so what I ended up doing was explaining harm reduction to the wider audience because that's what they're doing, giving kids sanitary items and things like that that they need. Um, and so lessening the harm done in the neighborhood for the kids being there in the first place. And so that, again, is another, a completely different way of dealing with harm reduction rather than just the drugs and, and um, prostitution programs that are in place. So what I didn't realize was that after 10 years of doing all of this work, dealing with all of these at-risk populations and helping reduce the risk of the consequences and remaining really, you know, keeping, keeping the non-judgmental approach going with all of this stuff was that in my personal life and in my world, the people that I consider my family, my friends, and people that I love, hackers, and people in the security industry are actually an at-risk population too. And what triggered it was something that happened about a year ago in November. And I don't know if you guys remember this or not, but a year ago, November, um, there was a high-profile suicide. Uh, a founder of a startup company that was an, intended to be a, a social startup um, committed suicide. And it was about five days after a Wall Street Journal article had come out suggesting that the startup that he and his co-founders uh, co had founded was a failure. And his body was found five days later in his San Francisco apartment. And this, of course, was very upsetting and very shocking for a lot of people. And what it did was it, it raised awareness about what the issues are for people who work in tech, um, specifically hackers. And you know, what type of mental states, what types of pressures they're under. And it got me really thinking about what type of risk, internal risks, 
that people in hacking and people in the security industry face um, as a risk population, in addition to all of the other obvious risks. Um, and so I started interviewing psychologists, and I started talking to a variety of different people about um, what the internal environmental factors are for hackers and for people who spend a lot of time in solitary areas um, and pursuing things that they're interested in that they can't really talk to other people about. Um, so I kept researching, and I kept researching, and I found some answers, but not a lot of answers, other than, you know, um, counseling and, and talking to friends and stuff like that. But I didn't really feel like that really solved any of the questions that I had or any of the interests that I had in terms of what type of, what type of harm and what, you know, how we could mitigate any harm that might be happening for my friends inside. So this came out about six months ago. It was published. And um, it was actually a study that was finished in 2011. And um, this is actually a, a collection of different studies about um, technology-driven crime. And it's fascinating. If you can get your hands on it, I, can hi I highly recommend it. There's a whole lot of really interesting studies in it to read. Um, but one study in particular that was in this that caught my attention was this study that basically asked if hackers are cognitively different than other people. And no one had really asked anything like that before. And interestingly enough, it was the first study that has ever been done on non-incarcerated hackers. Um, what these, right? <laughs> Don't get caught. <laughs> um, so. Teams distributed these eight-page surveys over the span of about 10 years um, to a variety of different conferences and a variety of different people, and people answered them. People, people answered the questions, and they were, they were very involved surveys. The study itself actually goes into a, a lot of detail about what was in it, including like income and you know, gender, gender identity, uh, a lot of really, really interesting things. But what the study wanted to focus on was the notion or the perception about hackers as to whether or not hackers are prone to having Asperger's. Now, if you're not familiar with Asperger's, it's something that started to get thrown around um, right around um, the, the diaspora suicide um, in that, you know, s the notion that hackers are, are Aspie. And what that is is uh, Asperger's is on the autism disorder spectrum. And Asperger's in particular, um, it's, it's it's typified by um, ob obsessive attention to detail, high, high, high intelligence, um, a, seeming, a seeming inability to have empathy, like completely not understanding what other people feel at all, and also seriously impaired social skills. Um, and what's interesting to me is that once I started to really poke around at this and talk to psychologists, that there wasn't really anything quantitative that, that had put this thinking into place, except a Wired article that came out around 2001 that basically suggested that hackers had Asperger's and put forth a lot of opinion on case, but didn't put forth any facts or anything like that, and then put a little, like, take this test yourself survey. And that's what kind of got the ball rolling in getting people thinking and starting to apply this really, really casual diagnosis to hackers. Um, interestingly enough, the results were very surprising. The results actually did not find that from the hackers that were surveyed that hackers had Asperger's across the board or were even remotely um, prone to having it. Um, instead, what, what the researchers found was that instead of, or rather the opposite of Asperger's, was something called intense world theory or intense world syndrome. And what this means is that rather than dis disconnecting and not feeling anything, hackers or at least the hackers they talk to, might be more prone to being the type of people who are actually feeling too much and are simply overwhelmed. And I found that very interesting because it's completely the opposite of the way that uh, hackers are characterized. So you've got that mischaracterization to take with you as well. Um, and as you can see, there's a little bit more detailed bit on the bottom here. Um, they feel too much in a room full of people and the information comes in too fast, then can be comfortably processed. This person would combat social anxiety by focusing on details and switching attention. And so that would be like um, talking to someone in like sort of an a uh, ADHD, um, you know, just moving too fast about different things. Um, but it's not, it's not ADHD either. So I find that very interesting. And what I've been trying to do is raise awareness about that. So one of the things I did was I, I analyzed the results of the study, and I published them on CNET, and talked to also more psychologists about what the results of this study might mean in terms of taking a look at hackers. And again, it opened up more dialogue and more interest for me in terms of what 
what made you guys more of an at-risk population? I mean, a lot of what the conclusions were, of course, were that hacking is a complicated gift for all of you. So that, that just actually opened more doors and made me want to investigate even further. So what I started to do at that point was doing more outreach and talking to more, um, more harm reduction professionals, more psychologists, more doctors, and starting to put together a risk assessment for hackers as a population. And what I ended up doing was having to do a risk assessment of what I see as the, rather than the internal factors, things that contribute to the internal factors, but also this, a general risk assessment for what hackers may or may not face. Legal risks, obviously, um, fighting common misperceptions between information sharing and advocacy. Um, and that's something I see you guys fight a lot, where what you're simply trying to do is impart information about something, and it's like, it's a lot like harm reduction in that we're giving information just to give people information because this information needs to be shared. And instead, people see it as, you know, glorifying or trying to put one over on somebody or, you know, making something look more glamorous or more sexy than it is. Um, and that's not actually what you guys are doing at all. Um, lack of support system in general, um, because the nature of the work is so solo. Um, you can't ask for help if you need help on things a majority of the time because what you're working on is secret um, or is too personal or asking for help means that you would have to share things that you simply can't share. Um, dealing with being an outcast to society um, because of the common misperceptions and mischaracterizations. Um, fighting in different institutions, which also goes along with being an outcast to the companies that you work for. Um, again, it's no one listens to hackers, so that's, that's not easy to deal with at all. Um, limited communications in terms of the ways that you can communicate about what you're doing. Channels, whether they're insecure or not, who's on them, who you're talking to. It uh, invites a level of day-to-day of -day paranoia. Um, Again, hackers are culturally diverse. Um, they may not be working in the same language of their targets or their allies, so there can be miscommunication around that. Um, some hackers are more at risk than others, especially ones who have exceptional talents or exceptional access, uh, because it makes you more of a target. Um, you're engaged in high stakes behavior. The high profileness of the information that you have or need to contain adds another level of pressure that you're under. Um, you have the inner risks, which is a lot of what I had been analyzing for the past year and talking to psychologists about. Um, you also have the pressure of doing things that you know are going to affect lots of people. And at the same time, even in your own communities, you're in this sort of moral universe where there's a lot of fronting, or you play or you get played, you secure or you get secured. So that, so this is what I'm relating, and this is a risk assessment that I'm talking to healthcare professionals about and psychologists. And it, the reactions I got from them were so sobering. So one of, the peop one of the psychologists I talked to, like I, I described this as a risk assessment, and the psychologist basically like there was a pause, and he said, you're describing people who are going to war. And another one said, another one said, um, oh God, she, she was really overwhelmed actually. Um, she said, it reminds me of something that we have. Um, she said, first of all, this reminds me of espionage and espionage psychology and what people deal with when they are working um, in the FBI or when they're working in different areas of espionage where they have to lead double lives. And of course, that it's, she did a ton of research and tried to find as much information as she could for me. Um, she works on the California State Ethics Board and um, trying to get information about espionage psychology and it is very difficult to get, as you can imagine. Um, and she's, but she said at one point, you know, this, this reminds me of something that psychologists deal with as well, um, which is basically the long-term effects of being secret keepers. And I was like, what, what are those long-term effects? Are we talking about something that would be along the lines of PTSD? Like, what, what are those effects and how, can we, how, how would we cope with those? And she said, well, in psychology, we call it compassion fatigue. And she described it as basically being secret keepers and having to, all of this information and all of this stuff to process and all of these feelings, but not being able to share them or relate to them, and also not being able to talk to anyone about any of it at all. And I was like, well, obviously it's not exactly like compassion fatigue, but how do you deal with compassion fatigue in the psychology profession? And she said, well, 
you know, it's the usual things. It's get exercise, um, spend more time with family and friends, and work less. And I was like, that doesn't apply <laughs> at all. <laughs> I'm like, you can't tell hackers to work less. I'm like, look, these people work in 24 or 48 and longer hour cycles without eating, without sleeping sometimes. And that's just the nature of the job. And you can't tell these people, like, you can't say, oh, you should do that less because this is who they are. And it's important. It holds them them together. And so, so there's been no work done in this area in psychology at all, which I find absolutely fascinating. And so what we then decided to do um, in more series of phone calls and discussions and meetings was to try and take a look at other populations that hold similar risk risk levels and risk assessment values as hackers, as in, in the areas that we've discussed here tonight to try and find other populations that basically self-apply harm reduction or have harm reduction models in place that mitigate the risks or reduce, reduce the, con the, you know, the consequences, the harmful consequences of the risks that they have by nature for who they are. And um, we thought of a couple of different populations, but the one population that a number of people kept coming back to were gangsters, um, gangs and gangsters. And basically what that came down to was having a code. Um, a number of people mentioned this while we were talking about it. Basically, it's the code of the streets. And the code of the streets is, it's something that's been around for a long, long time in, in outsider populations that engage in illegal or risky behaviors. And essentially what these populations do is they create their own codes, not necessarily of ethics, but sort of rules to live by that help them not get caught and help them make the best choices for themselves and their work and for the people that they care about. And the code of the streets is a lot like that. Um, so, you know, essentially this is a basic code of the streets right here. But I really felt like they were onto something. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to look at a really much more detailed code of the streets and see what that meant and what that looked like. And you'll see that it, in a second how it relates. Um, I wanted to take a look at a code of the streets that really made a lot of sense and also was one that was actually accurate um, to try and develop this and, and expand this conversation and try and figure out what these, what these populations are doing that are keeping themselves intact and keeping themselves from getting arrested um, and keeping their business going. And the, one of the best codes, basically, that has ever been spelled out or written out that's taken from actual street and gang codes was in a television show. It was HBO's The Wire. And The Wire was a series that ran on HBO for about five years. And what it did was it took a lot of real life instances um, of Baltimore street gangs and their highly, highly organized and very complicated businesses. And through this underlying theme of having a code or a code of ethics by which to operate by, essentially spelled out how this code works. And the code was personified in one character in particular um, who was actually based on a real life gangster who did have his own code, which I found out in my research. Um, and the code was, was very, very true and very real. Um, and the code basically spelled out as something like this which is something that I've seen and heard echoed in a number of places in different hacking communities. Um, so this character distinguishes between players and citizens. Um, well, he never robs or murders people who aren't in the drug trade, so don't do that. Um, but it's basically, like, you get the idea. Like, he doesn't go after anybody who's not in the business. Um, he doesn't do business on the phone. So, like, that's one of those things where it's like no loose talk, right? Um, and he also, you know, looks out for, it's the whole, like, look out for your own thing, um, taking care of the people that you run with, taking care of your brand, um, not trusting anybody, um, being really, really careful where you go, um, not telling on people, no snitching, like that sort of thing. So it's, it's very, very interesting, and I think that there might be some, like I said, this is an idea share talk, so there's some things in here that you, you might want to, I don't know, it's just kind of fun to think about. So with that, and then after we, after we were talking about that, what we did was we want to kind of take a, a look at some real life instances um, that hackers may or may not find themselves in that have interesting applications of harm reduction. And thank you for being so patient, listening to me talk about all of the other harm reduction stuff to get to this point. Because um, I wanted you to see all the different ways that it works and can apply. So one way in which w the failure of anonymity policies 
I think that's a great example. And by that, I mean anonymity policies as in anti-anonymity policies. Um, I think probably everyone in this room knows what a total complete failure those are, um, and yet, a lot of businesses continue to insist on enforcing anonymity policies, or rather anti-anonymity policies. Um, and what, what they're doing is they're taking a black and white approach to something they view as a risky, threatening behavior, um, and basically giving it a just say no. Whereas the truth and the fact of the matter is that regardless of what judgment or what morality or what ethics anyone wants to apply to anonymity, it is just going to happen. People are just going to do it. So the better thinking would be to do things, to put things in place that would mitigate the risk and reduce the harm or any consequences that might come from people using anonymity for any reason whatsoever. So thinking about the target populations that you would want to reduce the harm to and putting things in place to make it safer for them and also still allow people to, to do what they're going to do anyway, which is demand anonymity or spoof a system to get anonymity. Um, so, transparency and disclosure. Um, I, some of you may know about this, it's kind of old. Um, basically what we're talking about is, it, you know, it's the whole thing that I talked about earlier, no one listening to hackers. Um, and then having to come up with essentially um, disclosure plans, like having to figure out how to, how to navigate disclosure, um, whether it's responsible disclosure or not. And um, Rainforest Puppy Protocol um, is one of those things, it's probably over 10 years old. Um, but it's, 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 it's kind of a golden example of harm reduction all on its own, in that it's a system, it's a simple system put in place um, to deal with um, having, to, having to deal with um, disclosure around finding things and how you report them and then how you deal with indifferent institutions who don't listen to you and then how to deal with whether or not you're making a decision about mitigating harm for others that are probably going to be harmed by this company if the company doesn't take action. Um, another great example is hackers gentlemen's agreements where basically two entities decide to make an agreement or a truce to do something or not to do something because they know that the risk of both of them doing it or not doing it would actually be a greater risk or greater damage to the project or a greater damage to the hackers or a bigger risk for people involved. Hacktivism is one of the areas that I've been focusing on very, very specifically with, with looking at harm reduction models because um, I spend a lot of time around the EFF and I have for several years and I've done work off and on with people there. And um, harm reduction comes up a lot and I've been doing a lot, of, a lot of talk about harm reduction with a lot of the stuff that they've been doing in terms of um, you know, teaching people about surveillance, um, dealing with activists, um, dealing with people who do, you know, gray use, uh, gray area use of communication tools. Um, and I was recently uh, out to brunch with a friend of mine from the EFF who was just down in Brazil at this surveillance summit that they had in Rio where they got together and they did a ton of workshops about surveillance and dealing with communicating to activists and uh, at-risk populations about um, using communication tools and surveillance systems and how they're surveilled and how to deal with a lot of, a lot of different things. There was a lot at that um, summit and it looked awesome. But she was relating to me an argument, or a friendly argument, that she got into with someone from a European, sort of like a European version of the EFF. And um, this, this guy that she was talking to was like, you know, we, we just tell them not to use Facebook, and we tell them not to use Twitter, and we tell them not to use Gmail, and you know, not to use all of these, you know, all these free tools because, you know, they're, they're going to get caught. And she was like, that's like telling kids not to use drugs because these tools are going to be used by these people regardless. And he was very adamant and was like, no, no, I've, I've convinced a number of people to stop using these tools. But the problem is that, again, it's, um, these tools are just going to be used because these people aren't going to be able to not use these tools. They're in situations where these might be the only tools that they can use. Um, and so, what this presents us with is a very interesting real life harm reduction situation where you've got these people who need to use tools, they are going to use the tools that are best for them or that are most available or can meet them at their level that all their, the other people they need to communicate with are using. So what would you put in place in terms of harm reduction to try and mitigate that um, and try and reduce the harm for when things do kick in and people do start to get caught or, or worse? And, um, that reminds me of the code of the streets with no loose talk or don't talk about business on the phone. So perhaps a set of guidelines about what to talk about and what not to talk about when using those communication tools and what levels of communication are appropriate in different areas. Um, 
sort of like a best practices. So also along this line um, is something that is a talk that um, I'm going to show you a couple slides from, but I think that everybody should go definitely look at these slides if you haven't already. Um, it was, it's a talk that was called OPSEC for Hackers um, or OPSEC for Freedom Fighters um, by the Grug Q. And he first did this talk in Moscow at, oh, what was it? Zero, Zero Nights, that's right. Moscow Zero Nights in September and then again at Hack in the Box Malaysia in October. And these are some of his slides. And these are pretty fantastic. They're I, when I looked at these, I was like, this is harm reduction. This is, this is a code of the streets. This is all of these things sort of coming together in one place. And you can see um, it's a lot of the same sort of things. Um, guidelines against profiling. Um, do not discuss personal information in the chat. Like there's a great example of harm reduction about um, people who are going to use these tools anyway, even though the activists, you know, the, the activists advocates are telling them not to, they're going to use them anyway. So there's one direct instance of being able to apply something that mitigates potential harm. Um, and definitely go and look at this talk. There, there's a lot more of this in that talk. Um, and it's, this is something I think that should be shared far and wide as much as possible. So. There's no neat ending to this talk. Um, I don't have a call to action for you. Um, this is, again, like I said, it's an idea share about something that I've been researching and I've been working on and talking to a lot of professionals about. And, you know, I don't, this isn't a pitch for anything. This isn't, um, you know, go read these articles or go buy this book. This is just imparting a set of ideas and wanting to talk about hacker populations at large, about harm reduction and different tools that can be put in place um, in, a, in a way that doesn't judge what anybody does one way or another, simply says you're going to do this stuff, do it well, do it the best that you can, stay sharp. Um, and you know, I guess, okay, if I had a call to action tonight, um, this is second night of the conference, it's the weekend, so um, yes, go get wasted. Don't get wasted and drop O-Day, <laughs> right? That's harm reduction. So. I'm going to be around the conference for the whole rest of the time. If anyone has any questions, please come talk to me. Um, come talk to me anytime, or you can email me. And I, do we have time for questions, or? Of course we have time for questions. Oh, good. OK. Awesome. OK, so thank you. Please give a bit of applause. OK, so you probably know the drill. There's four mics, one, two, three, and four. You can also use ISC to ask questions. We have a nice signal angel over there. So you need to queue on the mics if you want to ask a question. Do we have questions from the internet? OK, go ahead. Thank you very much for your interesting and insightful talk. Since you referred to the security regimes, I started to think about Foucault. Foucault describes the making of criminals, homosexuals, etc., for the security regime. Would you agree that hackers are produced somehow by a discourse in the society? How could this be best described in the Foucault system? Can you simplify the question? <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone want to offer that up? The question came from the internet, so yeah. I'll, att I'll attempt to um, try to explain perhaps what I think the question is, but mm -hmm. really the original person asking the question should be the best person to ask it in Agreed. a more simple manner. Uh, I think he was referring to the cause description of the security processes and how actually um, security regimes create criminals and create homosexuals and whatever is criminalized at the time of Foucault, which was basically World War II. Um, in that context, the original question was whether um, you would agree with the idea that hackers as a community, as, an, as, as hackers are produced somehow by a discourse in a society. That is, whether the current society created the phenomenon of hacking. I understand, um, because that, that relates a lot uh, to conventional wisdom about uh, gangsters and drug dealers and people like that, um, that basically they, they come out of a broken society or they're a byproduct or a result of a broken society or a function of a broken society, and I think that I would have to entirely disagree with that. Um, 
I don't think that that is applicable at all because I think that speaks to, to, to take that position would be a, a judgment about the acts of hacking and hackers and the inherent nature of people who do hacking, which is a very curious nature and a need to open things and a need to share information, um, usually in a pretty non-judgmental way. And I think that this is a byproduct of an information society that is trying to breathe and grow and stretch and address injustices and address bottlenecks in the sharing of information and education and a lot of other things. So because the acts and acts of hacking oftentimes are illegal or in gray areas or seem shady or problematic. Um, and of course, you know, again, you, could, you get people who do everything for a lot of different reason, reasons, you know, from trolling to lulls to, you know, to justice to making beautiful pieces of art as systems. Um, the idea that, you know, hackers as a large and growing group, a population, is something that is broken, I think it's actually the opposite. I think it's the, it's, it's the act and actions of a society trying to heal itself. So, no, I don't think so. Thank you, and now Mike one, please. Howdy. Hello. So, I figure that people in harm reduction, educators, people coming into communities, um, are initially seen as outsiders. They probably have techniques for starting to gain the trust of community, starting to you know, develop a relationship with it. Um, I figure the hacker community is as wary of outsiders as others. Um, so. What are some techniques, say if you know people who are also psychologists who are interested in attending hacker conferences, what might be some ways to introduce a cross-pollination of caregivers? It's a really good question. Um, and it is, it's something that I did discuss because talking with psychologists about a lot of the issues, especially when I was doing risk assessments, um, it was, I was really, really hyper aware that I was talking to, I was talking to outside society who, who really didn't understand that the mistrust and how closed this, this population is in general. And that a lot of the things, a lot of the, the, the usual ways that they would want to communicate with this population are not going to work and they're not going to happen. Um, and if they do happen, they're probably going to get spoofed and trolled yeah. and, well, you know. You can't just email hackers at gmail.com. <laughs> right, exactly. So, um, I mean, and it all also depends on, you know, what we would be talking about in terms of doing any kind of outreach because I kind of feel like it, that I don't even know if that model would work you know like is this is this a community that would need any type of outreach I don't think so this is this is a very um, it's a very self individuated community like everybody here is on their own path um, and this isn't a group that usually does things as a group which is very very cool and very unusual so um, it's like find the leader we're all the leaders so um, yeah, I, I don't know because I, we did talk about this and I didn't have any specific recommendations. All I was thinking was that the things that they were suggesting weren't going to work if they wanted to actually make inroads or anything like that. Um, although the, the woman that, one of the women that I talked to, the one that was really interested in the, the idea of the long-term effects of what it's like to be a secret keeper, um, she's done actually a lot of the forefront work on psychology and tech and geeks and um, and is very, very not part of the usual regime. Um, so I think she's very interested in it and might run with it a little bit. She's done a lot of work, actually, interestingly enough, in the area of geeks and depression. Um, and she has a, I think, a, I think it's called, uh, oh, I think it's called Psychology 2.0 or something like that. It's got some silly title. But, um, but it's, it's, a, it's a resource, like it's a resource page. I'll actually, I'll put it up with the resource links with this. That's got like a lot of, a lot of like geeks and depression resources and things like that, so. She may pursue this. I'm not sure. I'm Thank not you. sure where I'm going to go with this either. I just wanted to share what I'd found so far. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. And internet, more questions? Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. To paraphrase the question expressed by a multitude of people on the IRC channel, one of them has asked, where is the list of tools that you can use? The list of harm reduction tools? Yes. <laughs> We're developing them. I mean, it's um, harm reduction. Harm reduction tools at this point are very specific for the different populations. So harm reduction tools for people who use um, syringe drugs and needle drugs. Um, you can find 
tools that are in place from you know uh, organizations that do outreach that are specifically like needle exchange or you know safe shooting areas you know uh, information about how to clean your rigs and things like that um, and then when you you know talking about tools for sex education harm reduction tools there there's a whole other set of specific things that involve communication and, and anatomy information and things like that in terms of a, a list of tools for harm reduction for hackers um, the, the closest I found is the talk that I saw that I presented a couple of slides from and that I think has a lot of tools but I don't think it has all of the tools and again you guys are such a diverse population and you come at it from so many different angles that I think that it's possible to put together a set of tools, but I don't know, you know, it, it, will, it will always be a pick a mix for all of you in terms of what works best for whatever job you're on or whatever direction you're going or whoever else you're working with, so. Okay, good, and now do we have any questions on any other mics? No, then just one again. Hello. Hello. Um, you treat uh, being a hacker like treating people suffering from depression or or, or post-traumatic stress disorder or similar, right? do you really think that it's a comparison which holds, which you can apply the same methods in psychology like doing for, for post-traumatic stress disorder or something? And if yes, do you think that this is going uh, to be possible to be treated like a depression or something else which is just not right on being a hacker? That's a very good question. Um, I think it's a mischaracterization that I hope wasn't communicated in that I intended to examine hackers as a depressed population because I don't think that. Um, what I intended was to tell the story of my investigation of this beginning with the suicide that happened a year ago and the issues that came up. And the reason that I made the choices that I did around the way that I investigated it was because I wanted to look at it from an approach that would be typical in society. So, and this, this is what I end up doing a lot in journalism, where I, I know how I want to research something, I know how I want to talk about it, I know how I want to tell it, but what I need to do is step back and take a look at it from the way the medical community would address it, and the way that it will be, you know, where, the way it'll be spun in media, and the way that people will want to look at it and, and treat the subject or treat the topic. So that's why I wanted to go the route of talking to psychologists, but that's also why I also wanted to talk to people in harm reduction because in the harm reduction arenas we don't see people who are interested in sex, we don't see people who engage in risky behaviors uh, of any kind as people who are damaged. We don't see them as people who are broken um, and as I said earlier um, as a matter of fact when you treat people like they're not broken who are doing risky behaviors the harmful consequences of what they do get reduced and they get to do the thing that they want to do and they get to do it well, but they don't you know, sustain any harm from it or they sustain less harm or they impart less harm to the people around them. And my fear and my worry is that at some point, you know, just as with sex, like in the United States, like we're dealing with this constant bullshit of people trying to say that uh, there's a, such a thing as sex addiction or there's such a thing as porn addiction. And there are, there are churches that put out fake studies um, that support evidence about the damages of pornography to society and you know, news outlets get this stuff and they spin it and they report it and then people start to believe it and take it as fact and it starts making its way into legislation and it really makes me upset because um, sex addiction isn't, and porn addiction isn't actually an addiction, it's not anything that's classified, there's nothing to, to support this. But what we have is a group think that watching pornography is a disease that must be treated. So what's the disease in being a hacker? I don't think there is one, but my concern but you is... you treat it like one, actually? I don't think I do. Okay. I just wanted to take a look at it from the way that other people might take a look at it and see what psychologists would say about what, what the things are that you guys deal with. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and more from the internet. Taking operational security as a basis for hackers' right way to do it, what additional points in terms of practical advice would you make? Well, 
I would definitely say to go look at all those slides. There's like 147 slides in that talk, um, and there are a lot more things that he detailed. Um, and it's, that OPSEC for Hackers talk is fairly complete. And that's something actually that when I was talking to the EFF about um, coming here and talking about harm reduction, they referenced that talk quite a bit as a, an essential in all of it. Um, aside from that, I don't have a lot more other than some of the other things that I suggested in terms of, um, you know, Res you know, dis responsible disclosure uh, policies and taking a look at other types of agreements or sort of sort of things that people have had to make on on the fly to set up a, a simple system in order to deal with you know tricky things that need to be resolved and get get through them in a way that's safe. So I don't have much more to offer than that, unfortunately, at this time. Okay, and now you, please. Okay. Um, hey, Violet, first, thank you so much for this talk. Thank you for uh, bringing it to the Congress. I think this is a very important topic. And also, I wanted to thank you for mentioning Ilya, because the, his suicide hit a lot of people in the community. Uh, another person within the same time frame was Len Sassaman, a good friend of mine. Mm -hmm. And I feel both of them were actually, um, I, I, I would say similar societal issues affected them, you know, in, in different ways, of course. So coming at it from what it seems to be in part, uh, maybe a, uh, a situational de depression type dynamic, I'm curious to use a metaphor in a sense. I imagine that most of the people in this room were perhaps one of the smartest kids in their classroom growing up. And I can imagine all the social dynamics which arose from that, maybe other kids being jealous or just not understanding, things like that. I am curious, has anybody looked at, to extend the metaphor of it, different classrooms in different parts of the world to see if those classrooms had different social dynamics and whether any of those dynamics spread maybe healthier environments for people or not? I don't know of anything like that. I know that there there are things like that, but specifically um, education, that type of education isn't something that I've done a lot of work in. Um, I've mostly done outreach to schools, but I haven't done, you know, and I haven't taken a look or, at any of the environmental factors growing up or in educational systems. Um, just conventionally speaking to the hackers that I've talked to, it's been varied. Um, and a lot of people with exceptional talent and exceptional intelligence have by and large, from what I've seen, either excelled or have been put into remedial programs. So that, that, those challenges start early, for sure. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we finally got a question from Mike Four. Uh, hello, uh, hello, I missed the, the first part of this talk, so sorry if it is, uh, well, if maybe I could have spared this question. And uh, it's uh, something that may be really obvious, so again, sorry. Uh, you said that there is no such thing as uh, porn addiction, and uh, okay, but still when you enjoy, when you use porn, you are like uh, using uh, one hour, two hours, more or less, it depends, of your life on that thing. And at the end, you could have used the time to do a lot more productive things, useful for other people. And when you have done it, uh, you don't really feel satisfied with yourself. And uh, on top of that, if you can say, ah, but you still watch films and uh, other kind of entertainment, uh, that's true, but like if uh, it's an horrible film, I can just stop watching it. And with porn, it's a little bit different. I mean, I'm like, my brain is override, and uh, when you start to get excited, obviously your hormones say to you that you have to go on until you jack off and so I, I hate to interrupt you but this talk isn't actually about pornography yeah sorry that's yeah, okay but you <laughs> you can always just find her contact information and just argue on Twitter if you want I'd be delighted to answer your question um, but perhaps at another time okay uh, thank you okay what I was about to say is that this thing seems to be a little bit like addiction but maybe it's just my flow point of view so okay thank you <laughs> okay thank you and now Mike one please Okay, yeah, so uh, when you talked about the concept of harm reduction uh, applicable in other places, I thought, um, and not judging people, I immediately, immediately thought to a conversation I had yesterday with a guy who had uh, an iPhone, an iPad, and a MacBook, and I asked him, why do you have all these devices? And his answer was jailbreaking. Um, so um, I would think that is harm reduction. I mean, we don't judge those um, addicts, 
even they, they themselves know that they are harmful effects, risks, or if you, if you free data from the cloud, for example, people know that and they take the risk. Um, is that a suitable analogy that hacking itself is yes. often is harm reduction, or wine, for example, like, like running Windows binaries on uh, other, other absolutely systems. no it's absolutely and that's something I've been thinking throughout this entire process well then it's then it's familiar to many of us yes exactly exactly and also the controversies that surround harm reduction in general like you know confusing you know people demonizing what you do because they're confusing information with advocacy you know just because you tell someone information about something doesn't mean you're saying go out and do it but a lot of people oftentimes think that that's what you're doing so but yeah there are a lot of parallels certainly Oh, okay. And but uh, are there like um, aren't there cases where harm reduction reduces harm, but reduces the perceived risk much more than the actual risk? Isn't well, that a risk in harm, harm reduction strategies itself that it appears to be overly effective, but? Maybe well, not be. That's one of the arguments against harm reduction, um, is that because you make a risky activi activity safer for the people who engage in the risky activity, that you're making the risky activity more attractive. And I think that because the activities that we're talking about are activities that are sometimes taboo or go up against societal beliefs or religious beliefs, um, I think that that's, that's up for discussion because I don't think that that is something that you can necessarily say is black or white. Or, or so, maybe we as a society even want it. Like seat belts have made driving uh, even safer, but um, and horse carriages are probably much more safer um, because they don't <laughs> go as far. But we as a society have decided that driving is safe enough. Like there are several thousands of death, uh, death every year, mm -hmm. but it's, it's safe enough that we can take it. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned seat belts because when people usually describe harm reduction, they mention seat belts. Um, so that's and it's not interesting. Yeah, <laughs> it's not as interesting exactly. Um, but I mean, it's you know, not having judgment about these things also doesn't mean there are no boundaries, and I think that that's a common misnomer as well. So. Okay, I'm sorry, but we're going to have to end now. We're running out of time. Thank okay. you very much. Thank and you. once again, just give me a minute. Okay. <laughs>